Hello and welcome to episode three of the Propagandopolis podcast. Today we are talking Peruvian propaganda with Joaquin Solis, who you might know as the man behind the fantastic Instagram account, A Dogmatic Prince. Joaquin is going to talk us through almost a century's worth of Peruvian propaganda with a special focus on three periods. The first is the fascist period of the 1930s. The second is the agrarian reform period of the 1960s. And the third and final is the shining path period of the 1980s. Uh, Joaquin will give us a much more detailed synopsis of the conflict. But for those who have absolutely zero knowledge, the shining path was a Maoist guerrilla group that in 1980 embarked on a brutal decade long war against the Peruvian government. Their propaganda is kind of truly unique among similar contemporary leftist movements. It has a sort of folksy art style and often with a very sort of Stalin or Mao-like veneration for the party's founder and leader, Abimel Guzman. It's a very interesting and lesser studied area in the whole propaganda universe. And I'm happy that we have Joaquin here to tell us all about it. And I hope you enjoy the episode. So Joaquin, thanks again for speaking with me today. Um, I think we agreed that we were going to start in the 1930s with the fascist period, specifically with the rise of the Peruvian uh, Revolutionary Union, the PUR party. Um, Would you be able to tell us a little bit about them, how they got big, what their origins were, how they took power, and then we'll move on to the sort of propaganda they published. The PUR was a Peruvian political party that was founded in 1931 under the leadership of Luis Miguel Sanchez Cerro, an army officer and later in life president. From 1919 up until 1930, Peru was ruled by President Augusto Leguía, a period that is known amongst Peruvians as the Onsenio de Leguía. Onsenio loosely translating into 11 years of rule. His rule was initially appraised for its efforts in modernizing the country and because of the high public spending that came to be that came to characterize his rule in terms of public works like um for example ample road works the modernization of ports and expansion in public transportation services the construction of several parks of several hospitals etc and you know well All of this sounds really nice on paper. The background reality was that the country had been ruled by an aristocratic class of Spanish descendants pretty much since its inception. And most work was highly centralized within the capital city of Lima. And during this period of apparent prosperity, the countryside remained virtually unchanged. The latter period of Leguía's rule uh, became increasingly despotic and this triggered um, To put it nicely, uh, mixed feelings among the Peruvian population. It was within this context that General Sanchez Cerro rose to prominence. Um, I'm going to omit parts of this story for time's sake, but the thing is that General Sanchez Cerro eventually overthrew President Leguía in a coup d'etat that started in the Peruvian region of Arequipa. So following his overthrow, Sanchez Cerro became the head of the provisional government junta from 1930 to 1931. And in 1931, democratic elections were held and Sanchez Cerro won. It's important to mention that his party, the PUR, initially didn't display a clearly defined political vision or ideological inclination beyond just nationalism. I think it's important to mention that it was only after Sanchez Cerro's assassination in 1933 that the party embraced an an openly fascistic rhetoric under the leadership of his successor, Luis Medina. So uh, inspired by the then Italian model of Benito Mussolini, this bizarro version of Latin American fascism manifested itself as a totalitarian corporatist vision for society alongside an opposition to socialism, liberalism, and representative democracy, and also important, a very vocal anti-Asian sentiment, uh, predominantly anti-Japanese. I think those two last themes, that is opposition to socialism and Japanese immigration, are the best exemplified themes in PUR propaganda. Yeah, well, I've seen you post a few here and there on Instagram, and they seems to have a pretty broad and interesting range of themes, um, the ones that I've seen you post. Uh, are there any that you sort of can quickly discuss that you, you think are exemplary from this period that sort of really capture the, uh, the essence of Peruvian fascist propaganda? So there's this first poster that the theme of it is anti-Japanese immigration. 
they saw the Japanese community in Peru as having a sort of stronghold, uh, a tight grip on Peruvian commerce and industry. So they became their de facto scapegoat in that sense. And I think that is something that you can clearly see in certain PUR anti-Japanese propaganda pieces. Yeah, there's that one that you posted that shows a massive Japanese man sweeping away like tiny Peruvian citizens from a building captioned Peruvian industry. I can't quite read what it says at the top. Uh, it says, um, Sigue la escoba japonesa barriendo los peruanos de la industria y el comercio, which would translate into the Japanese broom continues to sweep Peruvians out of industry and commerce. I see, fair enough. And um, there's the other one that you sent me, or the other one that you posted, uh, that sort of shows... It sort of shows like a scene in a, in a bull ring, I think. The caption is, and apologies for the pronunciation, it's a unificación paz y concordia. And uh, I, I don't really know what's going on here, to be fair. Can you explain it? Yes, it's very hard to tell apart because it's severely worn down, but you yeah. can see PUR militants uh, whipping away the APRA bulls. There's certain animals that come to symbolize certain, certain things in Peruvian society. Like, for example... Uh, an animal that you see a lot and it's a recurrent theme in many posters is the is a crocodile for example oh yeah uh, there's some other posters i can show you but in this case uh the opera party which was the leading left-wing party at that moment was symbolized as, as bulls because they were seen at least within the pur ethos as kind of like savages you know like monsters so this is like an anti-communist piece then Yes, yes, I guess you can call it that. I see, and and there's not really that much more from the fascist period, is there? Because I remember you said that the, the archives were a bit sparse or something. No, nah, they're severely worn down, and the quality the quality is not great. Some of them, some other posters have like accompanying accompanying text to give, let's say, more ample context. But the quality is so low that you can barely tell apart what they were trying to say. You know, it's just. That's time, you know? Yeah, man, it's a shame. I know a lot of other contemporary sort of fascist movements in Latin America were publishing some interesting stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking especially of the Integralists in Brazil. I published quite a few um, pieces from them on, on Instagram. So it's a shame there isn't more that we can work with for this period. But if there isn't, should we jump ahead uh, three decades to the agrarian reform period? Could you sort of talk us through that to us sort of like what happened in those intervening decades and how the sort of agrarian reforms began? So um, prior to 1963, Peru had been ruled by a military junta following a suspected fraudulent election cycle in 1960, 1963 that pushed the military to assume absolute power. So after two years of military rule, the country stabilized to the point where the idea of democratic elections started to gain a little traction. So in 1963, the military allowed for democratic elections to take place. And following a hard fought election cycle, the architect by profession, Fernando Belón de Terry, a let's say rather conservative candidate, was elected president after defeating the leftist candidate, Victor Raúl Aya de la Torre, the historic leader of the APRA party. APRA being um, an acronym for American Popular Revolutionary Alliance. So he won the elections by a margin of about five percentile points. While Belaun de Terry won the presidential elections, he lost both houses of Congress to the upper party, which, I mean, if we're being honest, it, it's never great when it comes to governability. I, <laughs> anyway, so uh, President Belaun de Terry was elected on a platform of reform oriented measures meant to combat the up until an overwhelming poverty in which Peru found itself in. His two biggest proposals being the agrarian reform, meant to combat the near feudal conditions in which Peruvian, the Peruvian peasantry found itself in, and the petrol renegotiation, meant to revise most of the international deals and contracts that Peru had signed into and that most people perceived as deeply unfair, given that the petrol profits weren't exactly reaching the people or the surrounding communities. By the way, we're, we're talking primarily about American petrol companies, that is the International Petroleum Company. Uh, I think they're still around, but well, anyways, uh, that's the platform that ultimately got him elected. 
but the ABRA party having a majority on both houses of Congress prevented these measures from being passed. Well, to be fair, some measures were passed, but they were to they were perceived to be severely watered down to the point that they didn't truly address the underlying problems plaguing the Peruvian peasantry. So um, anyways, jumping a bit into the future, 1968. After five years of congressional stonewalling, the situation in the country seemed a bit futile. They seemed to be going nowhere. And by that point, the incapacity of the political class to carry out any type of significant reform was pretty much in full display. Like, honestly, shit was going nowhere. So it was in this context that the military decided to act. By the 1960s, the military had adopted a, let's say, more progressive reformist attitude toward, towards national progress. But to be fair, this attitude wasn't entirely, let's say, socially influenced. There were also some legit national security concerns attached to it. Because, I mean, by that point, it was clear that something had to be done in order to avoid like large scale peasant uprisings tied to Marxist guerrillas. And this attitude was synthesized in the military philosophy known as integral security, a vision for the country that tied the, let's put it this way, the the need for economic progress to a certain level of social welfare within a framework of strong military authority. So uh, Jesus Christ, we're finally getting somewhere. (laughs) So in 1968, uh, a coup d'etat orchestrated by General Juan Velasco Alvarado took place with the help or with the help of or alongside high ranking military commands. A series of heavy reforms were enacted following General Velasco's rise to power. The International Petroleum Company was kicked out of the country and the remaining remaining infrastructure was seized and nationalized. This happened on the 9th of October of that year, and that is less than a week after the military coup. Uh, That day went on to become the Day of National Dignity. It's not a holiday or anything, but it's still a day of national celebration to this day. Now, uh, the most radical and controversial reform enacted by General Velasco was definitely the agrarian reform. There's many more layers and elements to this reform effort, but to keep it brief, I'll just mention that around 11 million acres of land were seized and redistributed to peasant communities and co-ops. Also, I feel like it's important to mention that while arguably necessary, because trust me, mates, people hold very strong opinions on the issue to this day. Well, the agrarian reform didn't fully live up to the mere utopian expectations interested in it. Among other things, the lack of modern farming technology, the lack of infrastructure, the lack of access to financial loans and credit, and um, and the lack of experience and self-management by most of these peasant communities limited the results produced by these reforms in terms of output. Ah, finally. Now, uh, with that out of, out of the way, I think we can finally discuss the propaganda side of this discussion. Yeah, definitely. Well, I have one up here. It's the it's the sugar one, El Azucar. And then you can see that well, the government is obviously investing in this campaign uh, a, a lot more. The style is very modern. It's very 1970s. It almost looks like they consulted some professional marketing agency or something to, to produce it. Um, do you know much about the circumstances around this propaganda campaign, like who the artists were, you know, wh- wh- where they worked and so forth? It was a bit of a different approach to it. So uh, Velasco's regime needed a medium to communicate the motivations and ideals behind this revolution of his side. It needed structure, it needed a name. So Velasco's government put together a team of artists, of poets, graphic designers, and propagandists. The, this team went on to become the SINAMOS, which is the National System of Support for Social Mobilization, which by itself is, is a rather clever pun. SINAMOS roughly translates to no masters, which I think like perfectly encapsulates like the spirit of this revolution of his. So the SINAMOS immersed itself in the history of Peru in search of an icon that could personify the spirit of Velasco's revolution. And they settled on Tupac Amaru II, 
Tupac Amaru II, born uh, Jose Gabriel Condor Canqui, is a, it's a Peruvian historical icon. He led an armed rebellion and an Inca revival movement against the then Spanish colonial authorities back in the day. And while this movement of his ultimately failed and he was executed, his efforts cemented him as a national giant of sorts. So uh, the Sinamo's chief propagandist, Jesus Ruiz Duran, chose Tupac Amaru to be the heart of the regime's propaganda machine. So what he did is Duran deconstructed the image of Tupac Amaru II. He depicted him in a highly stylized geometrical fashion. And many posters were produced that depict Tupac Amaru. Like, uh, we'll, we'll go through some of them later. But alongside Tupac Amaru, a world of very colorful and quite unique propaganda posters was also born. Uh, some of the posters of this era are, in my opinion, like some of the best we have ever produced. Just, you know, the colors, the composition, the themes, it's brilliant stuff, really. But, well, the the imagery associated with Velasco's regime came to be known as Popa Choral, which, well, sadly has no direct translation, but the closest thing I can think of is um, like gangsta pop, maybe. So Popa Choral mixed the then well-known like pop aesthetic with more indigenous nativist themes, showing colorful and like vivid depictions of the Peruvian, let's say, until then, invisible masses. <laughs> Gangster pop does make it sound a lot less cool. Um, but yeah, this uh this this sugar poster that I was just talking about, um, I've seen you, I've seen you post, obviously, it's definitely one of the most eye-catching and well, was it one of the most iconic posters from the era or were there other pieces? So, yeah. So that first poster is like uh, the one with the sugar industries. Yeah. Like, I feel like it like perfectly encapsulates like the aesthetic of it. Precisely. I think one of the most characteristic elements of it is the color palette. As you can tell, they're very like vibrant colors, you know, and there's a certain geometrical fashion to them. Yeah, that's definitely true. I think that's a sort of style that was predominant in Latin American propaganda, especially of the left uh, around that sort of time. I know it was very common in Cuba, where a lot of the propaganda in the late 1960s had sort of moved on from the the realism and the comic book style of the of the early revolutionary years and, and arrived at something a lot more graphically interesting. Um, I'm not exactly sure how you, how you describe it. It's probably like like a lot more pop art inspired, a lot more sort of stylized. Um, and there was a similar sort of thing going on in Chile as well with, you know, Salvador Allende and stuff like that. So um, this sort of, this wasn't happening in isolation, but it's still really cool stuff. I know there's another poster of Tupac Amaru, which I think is the most famous. Let me just quickly get it up. It sort of shows him in like an A shape and the caption is 190 years later, Tupac Amaru is winning the war. I think that's the I think that's the translation. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but yeah, can you talk to us about that one because it's a really interesting poster and I think it's the probably the most famous from the period. Yeah, I would say that that is like the quintessential poster. Just more well, the let's say the general shape of Tupac Amaru in that sense, like sporting his iconic hat and everything. I feel like that's a very to this day, like very pervasive symbol in Peruvian society. Like anytime there's a protest of any kind, really, you're going to see a couple of those. Like it's cemented itself like a, a like a symbol of national struggle and whatnot. Well, with aesthetics like that, I'm not surprised it's still a, uh, a popular protest symbol. Um, just a reminder to anyone who's listening that if you actually want to see the posters that we're discussing, I'll be posting them all on uh, Instagram and Twitter in a series and we'll also have a little YouTube video uh, to go along with it. Apologies if you're watching the YouTube video. Uh, so I think we should move on to the shiny path uh, period and conflict now because there's quite a bit to get through and to get through carefully as well because it's obviously a very contentious topic and a very sort of controversial period of Peruvian history. Uh, so could you just give us the shiny path backstory, its origins, where did it come from? Who were its early members and what did it want? Well, uh, the Shining Path was born in the mountainous and impoverished region of Ayacucho. 
I think this by itself made the Shining Path fairly, fairly unique and would later on give him an edge in terms of recruitment and internal cohesion. While every other major socialist movement and organization in Peru up until that point had their base of operations in the capital city of Lima, the Shining Path decided to take a different approach and establish their base of operations in Ayacucho, in the town of Huamanga, more precisely. But um, but let's let's take a step back. Uh, Ayacucho would be their geographical point of origin, but there's a few things that I feel like I need to point out in order to better understand their origin as both a political movement and terrorist organization. So um, the way I see it, there are two key events that led to the birth of the Shining Path, one national and one international. The first would be the Sino-Soviet split. So the first waves of this fracture within the then socialist world hit Peru during the mid 1960s. In 1964, the Peruvian Communist Party split into one pro-Soviet faction and one pro-Chinese faction. The pro-Chinese faction came to be known as the Communist Party of Peru Red Flag. The Shining Path would be born from a split within the the Communist Party of Peru Red Flag and would be led by Abimael Guzman, a philosophy professor for the University of Huamanga in Ayacucho. Now, the other key event would be the experiment in guerrilla warfare that was the MIR, the what well, we call it the Movimiento Izquierda Revolucionaria, which would be the revolutionary left party. The MIR was a guerrilla movement that was born from a split within the Peruvian APRA party, a historically left-wing party that, however, had gone through a period of internal reform and is now more of a classical conservative right-wing party. Well, this slow transition away from orthodox left, left-wing ideas caused many of its members to jump ship. Some of those members that would later become become MIR guerrillas initially called themselves the Rebel Opera. That split happened around 1950. But anyways, uh, by 1962, the group renamed itself, going from Rebel Opera to MIR and adopting a more personal, unique ideological doctrine. This organization considered itself to be neither pro-Soviet nor pro-Chinese, but was heavily inspired and influenced by the Cuban Revolution. So I guess you can call them pro-Soviet to a certain extent, but anyways, skipping a few years, they were the first national attempt at conventional guerrilla warfare, and their experiment began on 1965. They were sort of they were sort of an inspiration and example for what later became the Shining Path. But if we're if we're being honest, they were more of an example of what not to do. Their guerrilla venture would be over within a year, even less than that, so seven months or so, if I'm not mistaken. And every single one of their leaders would be executed. It was a complete failure. Like, holy shit, man, it wasn't even competitive. They just got demolished by the armed forces. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I think those two events in conjunction uh, for this, they both happened around the mid 1960s. They they provide a starting point in understanding the origin of the Shining Path and the series of events and historical context that led to its creation. I mean, I would call that part of the story the prelude, let's say, the gap between the, ni- the mid 1960s up until 1980, the year they began their armed insurrection and terrorist activities was mostly a a silent exercise in organization and recruitment. Not much is known of the Shining Path during these times due due to the secrecy in their actioning. But hell, one way or another, the story leads to May 17th, 1980, the day the Shining Path's first act of terror and first step towards their so-called People's War. It was the the burning of over 2,000 election ballots in the small town of Chushi in Ayacucho. So yeah, I think that's a fair, although heavily summarized retelling of the Shining Path's origins. There is obviously much more to the story, but I think for those of you not familiar with the Peruvian conflict, you will gain a, let's say, low to moderate insight into what it was all about. Yeah, could we quickly hear a little bit about its founder, the Shining Path founder, Abimel Guzman, because he would you know, arguably become the 
core focus of Shining Path propaganda during the conflict in the 1980s? I mean, Mai Luzman. So he began his, let's say, subversive actioning in the University of Huamanga in Ayacucho, where he was a philosophy professor. He was called many things by his students, some of which were, he had some nicknames, like, for example, some students call him the Puka Inti, which in Quechua means uh, the red sun. Some other students called him Dr. Shampoo because he had a way of brainwashing you. You know, he, he, he had a way of convincing people of falling into his line of thought. And I think that's something that will later on manifest in the shining path. I feel like uh, their starting point in Ayacucho, that isolation from some other leftist organizations provided a very cohesive framework for how the shining path operated. Like there was very little internal struggle in that sense. Like to interpret Abimael Guzman, I think a better approach to doing so would be almost as a religious structure. And I feel like that's one of the themes that can be seen manifested in propaganda, like uh, the shining path interpretation of history, like their ethos doesn't allow for like personal or individual heroes. It's more about the uh, collective struggle. But the one person that is like vividly depicted in those posters is Guzman. He's pretty much like the only person within the Shining Path ethos that is allowed to have a certain level of individualism in that sense. He was an undisputed leader in that sense. Well, yeah, definitely. In a, in a lot of the Shining Path posters that both you and I have posted on Instagram, uh, Gooseman often features as a sort of like a god or or at least some sort of celestial being or, or a shining entity, you know, in the sky as, as, as the nickname implies. Um, so yeah, so so 1980 is when this war started. It started with the burning of ballots and the sort of general call to a people's war. And uh, the first wave of Shining Path propaganda accompanied that initial call to war. I posted one recently, or actually reposted one from you, I think, that shows three kids writing on a wall, uh, like long live the people's war, PCP is like a little hammer and sickle that they've painted as well. The uh, the style is kind of folksy. It's not really anywhere near as graphically interesting as the stuff that Sin Amos was producing during the agrarian reform period. But yeah, style aside, they produce a hell of a lot of it. So do you want to quickly talk us through all that? Like what the sort of general themes and topics and subject matter is in Shining Path propaganda, the sort of evolution of it throughout the conflict, uh, different media, like was it just visual or was there sort of, were there other elements to Shining Path propaganda beyond like the visual? Well, let's start by the let's say aesthetics of it uh two things that in my opinion makes shining path propaganda unique are that for one they don't subscribe to the standards of socialist realism unlike many other posters produced around the same time by left-wing organizations unlike maoist propaganda for example that would probably be their biggest inspiration in terms of ideology military theory and praxis and even propaganda themes it's a weird contrast is a weird contrast if you ask me that to me sticks out like i feel like uh, the shining paths approach to art and propaganda in that sense would be yeah you're right the the artistic the artistic aesthetic of it was mostly like folksy i i think in a way that what you were saying about the maoist influence a few of the pieces that i've seen from the shiny path from the conflict do look very kind of early cultural revolution that is to say the sort of propaganda you'd have seen in china in the uh in the late 1960s so what is that some decade or so before the the uh shiny path conflict began in 1980 I guess there was also quite a bit of overlap in in themes between, you know, sort of shiny path propaganda and uh, and, and Maoist propaganda. Mm. Yeah, I think in regards to themes, like the shining path mostly dealt dealt in promotion of the so called people's war and anti democratic propaganda. Like some of the earlier some of the earliest posters we can find are doing precisely that, like urging the people not to take part in the elections of that year. And in terms of propaganda, um, I feel like let's say the propaganda outlets were mostly leaflets, you know, occasional propaganda posters and 
and many war songs, which um, I'm not sure if you were aware of that. They produced a lot of war songs. They were produced, recorded, and smuggled out of prison facilities. No, I didn't know about the uh, about the songs. So what what was the what was the genre? What was the what were the themes? Was it kind of all like people's war, anti-government stuff? Yeah, struggle, like uh, anti-imperialism. You know, that sort of let's say a uh, line of thought. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I just popped into my head. I think it'd be quite interesting to talk about how the propaganda was actually produced by the Shining Path because, you know, if you want to contrast it with the sort of stuff that was being produced during the agrarian reform period with Sinamos, obviously the Shining Path, a lot less centralised or more decentralised propaganda production. Um, that plus the Shining Path was predominantly uh, sort of like rural force, you know, they predominantly operated in, in, in the provinces and outside the cities. Uh, yeah, so if you know much about the the actual sort of methods and processes behind the Shining Path propaganda production, I'd be interested to hear a bit about it. You know, there, there's something fairly unique about the Shining Path in that sense. And I feel like uh, it relates somehow to what we talked about on the agrarian reform era like there those were two very different approaches to propaganda i feel like in terms of tracking down posters that's a that's a very difficult venture to engage in like in the agrarian reform period for example it was fairly easy and straightforward to track down a poster because there was like this centralized government effort, like uh, single-mindedly focused into producing propaganda. On the other hand, we have the Shining Path and their, let's say, their propaganda machine operated under a lot more secrecy and it was a more decentralized effort. So it makes it extremely hard, if not outright impossible, to track down certain posters and artists. Yeah, that seems to be the case with, you know, these guerrilla groups and insurgent groups. They're not, you know, they're obviously not going to be rigorously archiving all of their material. So, I mean, I guess that's just what we've got to accept and work with. Um, so on the other side of the conflict from the government, I've seen you post a piece or two of uh, anti-Shining Path propaganda, I think, produced by the government. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, one of them that we're going to discuss is a very interesting piece, I think. It's kind of like a anti-Senderista comic book. It he claims to be narrated by a former Shining Path militant who kind of relates all of the terrible deeds that he's taken part in throughout the war, you know, sort of ranging from like the execution of villagers to sort of just general pillaging stuff. Uh, I've seen you do a long post on it. I've posted it before as well. But uh, but but yeah, you know, sort of that one aside, was there much government anti-Shining Path propaganda material that you could find? Of things that I've been able to personally find, I think that, let's say, the government's counter propaganda effort was rather clumsy and it operated in a way that was very different from the way that the Shining Path operated. For one, yeah, there's that comic book that you mentioned. It's a, well, to be honest, it's a fairly unique propaganda medium. I haven't been able to find many other like propaganda comic books, but yeah, it was definitely one of the tools the government employed to, let's say, push people more to their side and away from the shining path. But uh, some other strategies that the government employed were, let's say, it wasn't an artistic effort, but there were some civil action campaigns like uh, that had the objective of um, how could I put this? They they had the objective of introducing introducing the Peruvian peasantry and let's say rural population to the national symbol such as the flag, the national anthem. It was a way of cultivating a sense of Peruvian nationalism as a way to let's say counter the shining path narrative and propaganda machine. Yeah, just quickly going back to propaganda comic books. I know I've seen it's obviously quite a rare format, but I've seen a few from the uh, from the Bosnian War, which are kind of interesting. So uh, it's you know maybe it was a, a bit of an early '90s phenomenon, <laughs> but um, but yeah, to to 
if we want to discuss like the probably one most well preserved piece of anti shining path propaganda from the period it's obviously going to be this comic book um, I have it up here now it sort of depicts in a, to be fair a similarly folksy shining path esque style the uh, the execution of a villager by a shining path militant and I think the title is Confessions of a Senderista is that right? Yeah, I feel like uh, I haven't read it like entirely, but I have a I've had a look at certain panels and certain pages and there is a narrative to it. I feel like what the comic book tries to do is it's a retelling from a, from a former Shining Path militant, like the way he was introduced into the movement, what exactly he was doing within that organization, its ultimate demise. You know, uh, it gives you an insight, let's say a more a more dramatic insight into how the Shining Path operated. Of course, they took some creative liberties, but to a certain extent, it was, yeah, it was on point. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that it was actually a full, like, coherent narrative. Um, I I thought it was just a lot of sort of unrelated <laughs> vignettes and anecdotes, you know, kind of demonstrating the, the wickedness of the Shining Path. Um, I presume a lot of the panels and stories are, are fabrications or... Like, uh, the characters in the comic book are fabrication, but they are retellings of actual, let's say, testimonies from ex-Shining Path militants. They had that half kind of like merged into this one personality just to give a broader, let's say, a broader retelling of how the Shining Path operated. Okay, well, it sounds really interesting. I've I'd only seen the cover, but maybe when I release this podcast, if I do a you know a series on Peruvian and Shining Path propaganda, I could do I could find a few more pages and you know images from this comic book and post them as part of a series. Just to move on to a different subject quickly, I know that the Shining Path wasn't the only sort of militant leftist group around this time. There was another one whose, whose name I forget. But um, it was a very, very brutal war, the, uh, the war in the 1980s. And the Shining Path wasn't the only group or or belligerent to be committing atrocities throughout the war. Oh, no, definitely not. Uh, for one, I think it's important to consider that there were multiple players to this conflict. Like you got the military, of course, you got the Shining Path, of course, but there were other organizations running around. Like, for example, the MRTA, the Movimiento Revolucionario de Tupac Amaru, which was another, it was another, let's say, guerrilla experiment. And uh, But unlike the Shining Path, let's say their ideological line of thought was more akin to it was more pro-soviet it was a marxist leninist organization but anyways uh if we're gonna decompose the fatalities into percentages we have to check the the official figures from the commission for truth and reconciliation i mean there is certain controversy to these figures but given that they get they get hate from both the left and the right you know that to a certain extent there is some truth to what they're saying you know so about 46 percent of all fatal victims were they died at the hands of the shining path while 30 percent were at the hands of the military and the remaining 24 percent due to other circumstances such as the mrta paramilitary groups the ronderos etc yeah thanks for that you know with a subject like as controversial as this it's obviously worth clarifying those things um do you want to quickly explain how the conflict ended because it ended quite suddenly in the early 90s didn't it so uh the end of the conflict was really the result of a massive intelligence effort one of the shining path's greatest strengths up until that point had been the secrecy under which they had been able to operate the command hierarchy of the Shining Path wasn't fully understood until the late 80s to early 90s, precisely because of this secrecy, and it had and it had difficulty in achieving any significant losses among the ranks. Uh, this changed in the year 1990, a year in which a series of targeted raids were carried out with the objective of apprehending apprehending Guzman. Uh, one raid in particular turned out to be crucial in terms of ending the conflict. A uh, raid conducted in a house located in the Limenian district of Monterrico Norte. Unfortunately, Guzman became aware of this plot to apprehend him, 
somehow and managed to move out just in time to avoid capture. However, uh, while the primary objective, let's say, of this mission, dubbed Operation Isa, failed, and Guzman and other high-ranking members of the Shiny Path managed to flee, a uh, number of key documents were seized that allowed the Peruvian authorities and intelligence apparatus to gain a deeper understanding of the structure and the hierarchy of the Shining Path and produced most of, most of the names and identities of the Shining Path's permanent committee, which, I mean, it was a fatal blow to the secrecy that up until that point they had managed to maintain. The the intel gathered from this raid will later turn out to be Guzman's, Guzman's downfall. Um, the Shining Path's ultimate defeat, that is, Guzman's capture, happened only two years after the discoveries made during Operation Isa in 1992. Um, in 1992, in yet another targeted raid, this one dubbed Operation Victory, um, this time the target was a house in the Limanian district of Surquillo. The Peruvian intelligence agencies have been tracking the movements of a certain upper class owner of a children's dance academy, of all things. And a number of strange behaviors and purchases were picked up and that put them in high alert. So the trash the house had been producing was collected under strict secrecy. And among the items found were, among other things, Guzman's favorite brand of ciggies, for one, and some other very specific medicines for an illness that he was suspected of suffering from. Uh, these discoveries solidified a lot of suspicions that had been harboring around this residence, and the raid was ultimately, um, the raid that ultimately led to Guzman's capture was given the green light precisely because of this. And yeah, well. The rest is history. Their hunch turned out to be right, and they apprehended him on the spot. Not only him, but most of the Shining Path's uh, permanent committee. I, okay, and then with that, with their capture, the Shining Path just kind of evaporated and the war ended. I mean, yes and no. There are still some small-scale operations being carried out by, let's say, uh, fractures or splinter cells from the Shining Path. But yeah, like it's it pretty much defeated the Shining Path in the sense that, let's say, the, the level of presence that they had been able to achieve so far completely disintegrated. I would say that that operation alone contributed, let's say, some 70 to 80 percent to ending ending the conflict. OK, and, and I think that I think I've seen you post that there are still a few like residual elements of the Shining Path existing today. Uh, what are they up to? What's happened in the sort of intervening you know, two decades. Do they publish any like interesting propaganda at all? Like, just to give you a rundown of what became of the Shining Path following Guzman's capture, uh, I feel like the Shining Path's greatest strength that ultimately also turned out to be their greatest weakness was the its internal cohesion, which was a product of Guzman's personality. You know, uh, following Guzman's arrest, uh, the let's say the head of the snake had been had been cut down. So there was a period of uncertainty and internal conflict within other high-ranking Shining Path militants. So they didn't truly, for one. I mean, there is a sort of mythology that grew around Guzman. He was viewed as almost like more than a man, like a sort of titan or almost like a god. So to a lot of its followers, it's it's capture. But at first, they didn't truly believe it. They thought it was a propaganda effort by the government. But, you know, enough time passed and they realized that it was legit. Guzman got apprehended. And following this, yeah, there was a period of uncertainty within the Shining Path and that initial cohesion that they had, that they had managed to, to achieve evaporated. And to this day, the Shining Path has gone through a series of splinters, a series of fractures. Like, I would say that the most, close, the most closely related to Guzman's, let's call it, uh, Gonzalo thought, which was his ideological line of thought in his, let's say, 
ideological contribution to left-wing theory, to put it some way. Like the most closely related would be the Mogadef, which is the Movimiento por la Amnistía y los Derechos Fundamentales, which would be the movement for general amnesty and fundamental rights. And following Guzman's capture and the signing of the peace agreement, uh, let's say what was the shining path at some point became the Movadif. It's like a direct, con there's a continuity between those two organizations, but their struggle nowadays is more political. That would be one and the main splinter, you know, let's say the central splinter. But beyond that, there were two other splinters, uh, one of which is still active and still waging armed struggle. That would be the, what, well, became the militarized Communist Party of Peru, which is an organization that is still active to this day around the Varaim region, which is the which is a region that is a confluence of some three rivers. Or so it's not just one region. It's like the jungle mountainous region within three departments in Peru. So they're still waging armed struggle. And the other would be the shining path onward, which would be the translation, but we call them, uh, well, they call themselves, uh, or well, called uh, Sendero Luminoso Proseguir. This was yet another, let's say, uh, armed escission from the shining path, but they were ultimately defeated, unlike the militarized Communist Party of Peru that it's still waging war and terror on the Peruvian population. Uh, actually, um, that latest massacre committed in Peru a couple of months ago, I'm sure you read about it, was actually perpetrated by them. And just as the shining path, just as their prior operations, it coincided with an election cycle. And following that, the massacre, they dropped propaganda leaflets urging the population not to take part in the elections. So you can see elements of continuity between between those two organizations. Although they no longer take orders from Abimael Guzman and the Central Committee, they still, to a certain extent, follow that same line of thought. And is there any sort of end in sight for this current conflict or? It's very tricky. It's very tricky. Like winning a guerrilla, a guerrilla war is, it's a very tricky effort. So far, I'd say that, yeah, there are no there are no signs of it ending anytime soon, but I guess we'll see. I mean, after all, one of the splinters from the Shining Path was ultimately defeated and its leader is apprehended. So, I mean, it is possible, but I, I couldn't say it like uh, I couldn't be sure about it. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, if there's anything to learn from the sort of sudden end of the 1980s conflict, it's just how unpredictable all of this sort of stuff is. But yeah, anyway, mate, thanks you know, so much for speaking with me today. I think we've managed to get through a lot. Um, again, for anyone listening, we're going to be making a YouTube video displaying all of this propaganda while we discuss it and also doing a series on Instagram and Twitter. And of course, if you want to go straight to the source, you can follow A Dogmatic Prince on Instagram. That's at A D O G M A T I C dot P R i n t s but yeah mate you know thanks so much for speaking with me yeah no worries man it's been been a really nice conversation and thank you for having me not at all thanks again so that was joaquin solis of a dogmatic prince speaking with me about peruvian propaganda from the past century you should definitely go and follow his account it's basically an archive or gallery of peruvian history art and culture lots of very interesting stuff there uh, thanks again to everyone who's listened to this episode all the way through apologies for the big gap between episodes i've been moving but it should be back on track now looking like i have some cool guests lined up for future episodes uh, to anyone who may have arrived here from somewhere other than propagandopolis you can follow me on instagram twitter and youtube at p-r-o-p-a-g-a-n-d-o-p-o-l-i-s at Propagandopolis. Thanks again for listening.